Hey everybody, today we're going to expand on the concept of the binomial theorem from the other day and use it to answer some pretty cool probability questions. Let's get started. When I teach this in a classroom setting, what I usually do is start off by giving everybody a coin and saying, I need you to flip it 10 times and um, I want you to count how many heads you get. And we gather all that data and we look at what's the probability that somebody gets at least seven heads. And uh, sometimes it's fun to guess ahead of time what that would be, uh, but we're going to be able to calculate that sort of question. Uh, that's an example of what we call a binomial experiment. So to truly classify as a binomial experiment, you need to have something that's repeatable and has exactly two outcomes. So in this case, the coin flipping, uh, there's either a heads or a tails. And uh, you need to have some fixed number of trials, and so that would be 10. And uh, those trials need to be independent of each other. Uh, what that means is that uh, the result of the first trial doesn't somehow influence the trials later on. And uh, they have to have constant probabilities. It doesn't have to be the same. With a coin, it is, right? It's either 50% heads or 50% tails, but uh, those probabilities can't change throughout the problem. And so if you have something like that, it qualifies as a binomial experiment. Binomial experiments can be, or the, those probability calculations can be found then by examining this binomial. Um, so if you take S, which usually stands for success, um, plus failure, and you raise it to a certain power, um, each of those different terms then will tell you uh, the probability of success and how many different ways there are of making that sort of thing happen. So let's look at uh, the coin example. So if we wanted to answer this question, uh, what I need to do is take this polynomial and multiply it out, h plus t raised to the 10th, because I either get a heads or I get a tails, and I'm repeating this uh, experiment 10 times. So I took the liberty of typing that up for us earlier. Um, the orange numbers here are the numbers from Pascal's triangle, specifically the 10th row of Pascal's triangle. And then each term contains uh, either 10 heads, or this is nine heads and one tail. There's 10 ways to make that happen. Um, if you want eight heads and two tails, there's 45 different ways uh, that you can make that happen and so forth. So each one of these um, terms tells us how many different ways there are of getting um, five heads and five tails. And since that one, there's the most number of ways you can do that, that's the most likely outcome. Um, but six heads and four tails, even seven heads and three tails, those are still pretty likely options. Now, each one of these terms, um, you can calculate the likelihood that that thing happens. And uh, it's kind of neat to do this on a calculator. Uh, what you would do is take, um, uh, and first of all, store the probabilities of each of those things happening into the variables, uh, h and t in this case. So one half is the likelihood that you get a heads, uh, one half is the likelihood that you get a tails, and so if you store those in, then you can calculate all sorts of different things. For instance, if you wanted to know what's the likelihood that you get 10 heads in a row, then you simply type this term in, h to the 10th. And so if you do that, you get 9.765625 times 10 to the negative fourth, which is a really tiny percentage, much less than 1%. Um, so I'm gonna round that to about 0 0.009. If I wanna know the probability of getting nine heads and one tail, well, you can type that in. And if you type that in, you get 0 0.0097, which is just under 1%. And you could do the same sort of thing for each one of these terms. If you wanted to know uh, the likelihood of getting eight heads, um, type that term into your calculator. That's about 0 0.044, or about 4%, 4.5%. Four uh, seven terms is, um, or seven heads, excuse me, that's about 11% of the time. And if you want to know the probability of getting at least seven heads, well, that's the combination of all four of these terms. So if you take all of those and add them up, that's the probability. 
Now you could do that as individual numbers like this, uh, but you could also do that uh, in one step on your calculator if you wanted to, if you typed that expression in. Um, so this is the probability of getting 10 heads, nine heads and a tail, eight heads and two tails and so forth. Um, you end up with about 17%. It's kind of cool when we do this in the classroom um, to compare the theoretical probability of 17% with what we actually got. And uh, some years we get a little bit better uh, than 17%. Sometimes we get a little bit less than 17%. But overall, it's pretty close to 17%, which is, again, kind of cool. So here is a, another question follow-up question, uh, kind of a theoretical one here. Suppose um, at school, uh, teachers give out homework, right? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And uh, let's suppose that teachers give out homework with a probability of 40%. If we wanted to uh, calculate, like, what's the probability that you make it through the entire day without getting any homework? Or what's the chances that you have three homework assignments or something like that? Um, what we would need to do is to assign probabilities to either getting homework or not getting homework. And so um, in this case, getting homework in an individual class is a 40% probability. And so I would store uh, 40 over 100 into H in my calculator. And then the probability of not getting homework would be 60%, uh, right? 100% minus 40. And so I would store 60 one hundredths into uh, maybe the variable n. And if I've done that, then what I need to do is expand homework or not homework. And um, at North Point, there's seven classes usually that students take. And so we'd raise it to the seventh power. And so if you do that, pull out Pascal's triangle and find the seventh row. That's 1, 7, 21, 35, 35, 21, 7, and 1. And uh, then h to the seventh. Here's h to the sixth and an n, and so forth all the way down the line. And now each of those terms tells us something. If we wanted to, for instance, answer the question of what's the probability of getting no homework? Well, that would be this last term right here, where I have uh, no homework in any of my classes. And so if you calculate that, um, if you type n to the seventh into your calculator, you'll get that likelihood. And uh, you probably know from experience that that's not very likely of it. If you wanted to know um, the probability that you'll get homework in every hour, so homework in every hour is this first term, right, with h to the seventh. If you want to know the probability of getting homework in one class, so which term do you think that would be? So hopefully you saw this term, right? No, that's not homework in one class. That's not getting homework in one class. Oh goodness, I messed it up, didn't I? Let's see, this actually should be this term over here, right? Homework in one class um, and not homework in six classes. All right, probably messed the next one up too then. Let's see here. What's the homework, uh, the, the term you need to find if you want to know the homework in two classes? I said earlier that that's not even close. <laughs> Oh, this is crazy, isn't it? Anyway, it would be this term right here. And if you want to know the probability of getting homework in four or more classes, so four or more classes, that's going to be a combination of terms. I think this is the one that I did. Yeah, there we go. So four or five or six or seven classes. Type any of those expressions into your calculator and you've got your answer. Let's take a moment and just think about how accurate these calculations ought to be. Um, how true uh, of a binomial experiment is this? So remember, a binomial experiment has exactly two outcomes. And so that in this case, we've been saying homework or not homework. And so um, that's fairly true, although sometimes there's homework and it's not due the next day. It's due like in a week. And so then do you really count that as homework or can you put that off? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure that this qualifies as having exactly two outcomes. And of course, some, some classes you might have two or three assignments in if you've got a really horrible math teacher, right? Um, another question. Uh, do you have a fixed number of trials? 
uh, that would mean do you have seven classes every day? And so uh, right now, um, that's true, right? You go through all your classes and you have seven classes every day. At least when we were in school, we did that. Now that we have distance learning, and I don't know, I guess you kind of have seven classes a day still. Um, so if we ever move to block scheduling, where you have like four classes one day and, and four different classes the next day, well, then uh, this might not be so true anymore. Um, are the trials independent? So does that mean, uh, or what that means is does um, Mr. Schenk and Mr. Rohr, um, do we assign homework kind of independent of each other or do we collaborate and scheme and purposefully try to give you um, extra, extra hard days? Um, everybody tries to give a paper the exact same day, right? Um, we actually try not to do that. We do have a schedule and of who's assigning what where and so forth, and we try to. So um, I would actually argue that this is not really independent. Um, but uh, anyway, that's what that would mean. And uh, have constant probabilities. That would mean that um, every class has a 40% chance of getting homework. And uh, you know that's definitely not true. There are some classes where the probability of getting homework is nothing. And there are other classes like math, for instance, where you probably have homework every day. And so uh, that's definitely not true. And so in this particular example, while we could use this sort of thinking to calculate things, um, we realize the numbers, the probabilities we get are not necessarily 100% accurate because there are certainly um, some wiggle room in these calculations. So, in general, um, calculating the probability of um, uh, a binomial experiment is summarized in this little formula here, um, where uh, A and B range um, from the successes that you're interested in. Uh, this is a coefficient from Pascal's triangle. S is the probability that you have success, um, that you get whatever it is that you're thinking about. Um, and then F is... Uh, the probability of failure, which is the complement um, subtract from 100% of success, right? Notice um, the, uh, well, anyway, uh, this formula is great and all that, but uh, I don't usually think about this. I usually just write it out and um, look at which terms I need to do. If you really did need to uh, type up a huge problem, um, you can use uh, the calculator's sequence tool to make this happen. As a reminder, the sequence tool is uh, sequence, and then you type some sort of formula, and then your variable of interest, and what it starts and what it stops at. And so the formula is going to be um, uh, something, NCR something, and then we're gonna multiply that by our success variable, raised to the n, and we're going to multiply that by our failure variable raised to the n minus 1. Um, and so the variable in this case is going to be either i or x or whatever letter you choose to use here, and then whatever you want to start and stop it at. And so from a to b, uh, we'll do an actual example of this in a second with numbers so you can see how it works. So, uh, if you want to try this problem on your own, um, it'd be a good idea to pause in a moment and uh, try it. I'll read it a moment. This says uh, that your coach is promising you ice cream if you can make eight or more free throws out of ten. So, end of practice, shooting ten free throws. You make eight, nine, or ten of them, and I'll get you ice cream. And so, your free throw percentage is normally 65%. Um, what are the chances that you'll be getting ice cream? So it's not quite the 80 or 90 uh, percent that you need to get 8 out of 10, but you know you might have a good day and um, make uh, a little bit better than your normal. And so anyway, see what you can do to calculate that. Um, uh, now you can hit pause, uh, otherwise I'll bring out my answers. So need to expand um, success and failure to the 10th because you're shooting 10 Form, uh, free throws. And so that's uh, this expression here. And the parts that we're interested in are making 8, 9, or 10. So having success 
uh, eight, nine, or ten times. So it would be these terms. So if you were to type this into your calculator then, uh, you would type 0.65 in for s. Remember the store button is um, on the bottom of the calculator down here. And 35% uh, in for failure. And then you would type this expression. And uh, that got us about 26%. So uh, your coach might be buying you ice cream, but uh, chances are you probably won't hit 8 or 10 if your success rate is only 65%. I do want to show a real quick uh, variation of this using um, uh, the sequence command that we can do. So if we wanted to use the sequence command, we still have to start with 65, store that in for S, and 35 and store that in for F. But then um, what you would type is uh, sum of sequence, and then I need a formula, uh, the variable of interest, the start value for that and the stop value for that. So the formula is uh, the number from Pascal's triangle. So in this case, I want the 10th row of Pascal's triangle. Those are NCR calculations. And uh, I'm going to um, we'll choose x to be my variable because I want the um, uh, first, second, and third, or the uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th, depending on how you want to think about it, um, numbers from the 10th row of Pascal's triangle. And so I want to multiply that by um, the likelihood of getting my successes. And so um, I'm going to take success and raise that to the x. And I'm going to multiply that by the chances I get failure. And so that's failure raised to the, and this is no longer to the x, but these go um, these are subtracted from 10. If I make it twice, then 10 minus 2 is 8 misses. And so I need to raise this to the 10 minus x power. So that's my formula. In this case, um, there's a couple different variables in this formula, right? S, F, and x. The one that I want the calculator to change is x. I want S and F to stay those percentages the whole time. And so this is where that variable part of the formula that you may have thought is just kind of worthless. Why do I even bother typing it? This is where that really comes into play. Uh, X is the variable that's going to change. And um, I'm interested in eight successes, um, nine successes, or ten successes from eight to ten. And so um, start at eight and end at ten. And so if you type all that into your uh, equation, you should get that same uh, seven what did we say, 26% um, number that you had last time. Anyhow, I hope that helps. Um, if you have some questions about how this works, uh, please uh, let me know. Send me an email, and I'll be glad to help. Hope you have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you later.